We are back. Giants baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho. The host of the show is Tim Haller. Timmy Boy. Hey, Ralph. How are you doing? We've got a special guest tonight, Ralphie. Yes, A very special person and in my life, too, so uh, I'm looking forward to our show. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know him on a, a personal level. Why don't you do the honors um, of introducing the man of the hour? All right. Well, this, this gentleman, Joel Youngblood, is our guest, and I want to first reach out and thank you, Joel, for joining us this evening. Um, little does Joel know that as a young guy playing and then, uh, you know, drafted in 1981, he did not become a member of the Giants until 82. Is that correct, Joel? Uh, 1983. 83. Okay, so at that time I was toiling uh, in the minor leagues, but I would have an opportunity to come uh, and uh, work out with guys and everything. And Joel Youngblood, and he doesn't know this. I never told Joel this. And, of course, I had the opportunity of meeting him just because Dad was the GM of the club, and, and uh, Joel was a free agent signee. Is that correct? Did Dad sign you as a free agent, Joel? Yes, yes, he did. He, uh, he went out on a limb and signed me. <laughs> well, it wasn't too. Uh, you know, out, out of out, out of all of the uh, his his history as a GM, we know wasn't that successful. But one of the things, one of the smart moves he did was securing you, and you really did a great job with the Giants. Your your whole career, really, as a utility player, was something um, significant and something to really talk about. But for me, a young guy playing who really was limited in abilities, et cetera. Um, not like you were. You were, you know, a major league hitter. You, you, you were 31 hits shy of a thousand hits. Um, I looked at, at some of your stats earlier today, and and I was really quite impressed. But I always was impressed just by your work ethic and the fact that you were always ready to play no matter what position. What what's your mindset like as a player like that? What are you going through in your head? Well, Tim. If we go back in my career, uh, I came up with the Reds in the 70s, and they had quite a few superstars on that team. Uh, so I was really, if I was going to have any value, value for the Cincinnati Reds, I had to really have multiple positions. But quite frankly, I signed as a catcher out of high school, and the first day of spring training, they put me on shortstop. I played shortstop that year. I played second base the next year. I played third base the next year. And then I went into the outfield. Uh, so I had experience in all the positions before I got to the major leagues. Not a lot of experience in some of those positions, probably the most in the outfield. Uh, but having that history gave me the confidence to go in and, and play the you know, the best I could when I was offered the opportunity to go in the game. Did you ever catch at all in the big leagues? Did you ever have an opportunity to put on the tools of ignorance when you were in the show? Yes, I did. I caught one time in my career in a live game, and it was in 1976 with the Reds. We were playing in Jerry Park in Montreal, and it was a Sunday day game, and Johnny Bench was catching and we had a big score on the Expos, like seven to nothing, and so Sparky took Johnny out for the rest of the day game and put Bill Plummer in, and Bill Plummer took a third strike and got mad at the umpire, and the umpire kicked him out. And uh, Sparky looked in the dugout and says, oh, what am I going to do now? And I said, well, I've been warming up all your pitchers for the game. Let me go in. I signed as a catcher. <laughs> so I got the game. I caught I caught five innings of a shutout, and the game was over, and that's the only time I ever caught in, in a game. Well, wow, that's that's they awesome. Went, they I never went back to you, and, and you didn't end up beating out Johnny Bench. <laughs> it, it was really funny. <laughs> they walked up and said, "Look, they said, look, kid, we have Johnny Bench and we have Bill Plummer. We don't need any more catchers. We want your best stuff." Well, if, if if memory serves well, and and you know, Dad used to talk to me a lot about you know personnel and. And, and moving guys here and there. And one of the things that he, he made it very clear. He said, we're only going to two, carry two catchers. 
because young blood can catch. So if we ever need him to catch, he'll put on the he'll he'll get behind the dish. And I'll never forget him saying that. I'll never forget him saying. That. Well, he did, he did his homework. Yeah, he did. And by the way, you, Joe wasn't the only thing your dad ever did good for the Giants as a GM. Your, we've talked about this briefly, but we don't give enough credit to your dad that um, he drafted guys like Robbie Thompson and Will Clark and Brantley and and Ojeda and all those guys uh, in these two or three great drafts um, along, that made the 86, 87, 88, uh, you know, when these guys started getting good, uh, Al Rosen – took over, and your dad got very little credit locally in the Bay Area for supplying, you know, supplying that team, you know, bringing those guys I, into the organization. So I, I just agree with you, Ralph. That. Pardon me? I said I agree with you. 100%. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, because and when, when he recognized... He, he recognized two, uh, I would say, Joel, this isn't an insult. You're an overachiever. This is, this is a compliment. And it, I think you did more based on, on uh, your natural ability than, uh, um, you know, than you could have. And that's a, tremendous. Robbie Thompson was that way, and he recognized that determination in Robbie and um, he had it, you had it, you had it, and still have it. What are you doing nowadays to um, transcend that positive um, energy? Well, Ralph, number one, I think the the description for who I was and who Robbie Thompson was and most of the other players, it's the love of the game. Uh but I'm, I'm still in the game. I'm coaching with the Arizona Diamondbacks. I've been with them for the last 11 years. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm still going strong. I, I kind of feel like I have this uh, responsibility to share some of my experiences with these young kids to help them get to the big league sooner uh, because I know what some of the requirements are. I know – the discipline you have to have, the dedication, and, and you know you have to you have to educate these players and teach them not not how to play the game. They already understand how to play the game. Teach them how to think. Uh, teach them you know what to think about. But those are some of the things I'm still doing today. Because um, I never played the game at the level at the level beyond uh, the schoolyard, <laughs> so. I'm going to ask both of you this question. Whatever position you are playing, what do you think about between pitches? Uh, you, you too, Joel. Yeah, let, let's hear from the major leaguer. Well, it, it depends on how your day is going so far. You know, there's, there's, you have a lot of time before you have to lock in. Normally when the pitchers look at the signs, you should already know how many outs there are and what the count is. If, if you don't, you take a quick look at the scoreboard. But that takes a half a second. Uh, in that other time, you're just kind of drifting. You know, your mind's just kind of drifting. And once that pitcher starts warming up, that's when you lock in. And you lock in for that pitch. And then when, he, when the catcher throws it back, he kind of drifts again, kind of gives you that little freedom to get back into that concentration. And you think about the game situation. In other words, if it's a ground ball hit to me, I'll go to second. If it's this type of thing, fast runner, slow runner, all that goes through your mind in an instant. Am I correct? Yes, it, it's really automatic. Uh, it, it, you know, if you don't know a player – but you know what you're going to do with the ball. If you are if you play aggressive and they hit a ground ball, you're going to charge it and challenge that runner. Uh, right. You know, and so that's, that was always my position to 
my my goal when I played the outfield was throw people out and climb the fence to catch a fly ball. So that was my goal every, every day. Uh, if you couldn't catch a fly ball, go in the infield and start taking ground balls. But it was making the hard play that I, I was always concentrating on. Uh, you know, having, having the pitcher get really excited or seeing the hitter, the opposition, making that turn at first base and going back in that dugout and sitting down when he thought he had a double or triple. Right. Nice. Absolutely. Nice Absolutely. Yeah. Timmy, you want and to the, Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and Joe will vouch for this, obviously. If you're playing up the middle, if you're playing second base or shortstop, um, and even if you're up short, you're, you're, if you've got a man on base, less than two outs, you got a guy on first, you're communicating always with that second baseman with verbal or not so much verbal, but either a mouth signal, I've got the throw, you got the throw, because you got to pay attention to what the pitcher's throwing, off-speed stuff, fastballs, whatever, because you need, may need to cheat one way or another, you know, a step over one way or another. Uh, who's going to cover the bag? Um, all of these kinds of things are going on between pitches. Um, now, so your heads were obviously, both of you, your heads were in the game. Are there players that – that you coach, that, without naming names, of course, um, that you go, my God, what were you thinking uh, on this play? You, did they come back to the dugout, and do they have some accountability when their heads are up their butts? That's my, my at the major at a major league level, or is it just I'll pick you up, you know, come on, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh. I would say it happens every now and then, but normally the older players, the veterans on the team, would would go talk to that guy or and let him know that that's unacceptable. Uh, but normally, most most people are in tune with what's going on, uh, and and you, you very seldom see. I mean, errors are part of the game. They just they just happen. That's, that, that's controlling your concentration. Uh, but, you know, a mental error, like just not knowing where to go to, on a cutoff and relay or throwing the ball to the wrong base, you know, it's, right. it's so obvious. Everybody always already knows, you know, nobody has to tell you. The whole the whole 30 or 50,000 people already know you made a mistake, you know. Okay. And at the major league, it's unacceptable uh, to play like that. Oh, yeah. Okay, I understand that. I have one more question about coaching at the big league level. How much okay. teaching goes on? In other words, a kid comes up, hot prospect, this, that, and the other thing. The way things are, they kind of rush through the minors at, you know, this, the way baseball is at, at this point. Um, sure, when you were, I don't know how many years you spent in the minors, but um, kids seem to be rushed more nowadays. How much teaching goes on at the big league level? And um, have you had a personal experience of turning someone's career around, so to speak, um, who is particularly receptive to you as a coach, player what? type thing? A absolutely. Uh Number one, the education never stops, regardless if you're in the minor leagues or get to the big leagues. You're always learning. It, it, you know, the one thing I always say, if you control the way you think, you control the way you play. It's our jobs as coaches to teach you how to think, which means understanding how to practice. Uh, if you're not practicing perfectly, preparing yourself to fail. So it's my responsibility as a coach to teach you how to practice but the only way I can teach you how to practice is to tell you why this way is better than any other way in, in, a, in a way that you'll understand your opportunities to be successful. Once you can get through to the player that you have their attention, they understand, you know, what, you, what you're saying is validated by what the reason why you do it, then you, you know that you have the, their concentration and their attention. But I, I believe that it's always a teaching more than a coaching. Uh, I'm a coach by trade, 
but in essence, I'm a teacher. I'm teaching the proper fundamentals of baseball. I'm teaching the proper outlook, how to control your emotions and your success. Uh, and, you know, and a lot of people might say, well, how do you control your success? Well, from an offensive standpoint, if I can control my opportunities, I will control, I will control my, basically the result I want to have. You know, and so it's just more of an understanding how to connect things that make sense to you, and therefore, you know, that's when you captivate a player, and that's when they start taking off. Okay. Um, did you, you and Timmy went to the fantasy camp recently? Am I correct? Yes. Yes. Would Would you? Because I'm I'm like this super fan, <laughs> so <laughs> and I've never been to a fantasy c- camp. Would you guys talk about your experience there, at, and in particular um, at the Giants fantasy camp, and who were some of the other players that you, you guys got to hang with, and uh, what's that experience like for uh, you as an instructor at, at the camp, a coach, instructor? I, um, what's it like, Joel? Well, for me, it's no different than it than it is in the professional level. I, 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 if I'm working with a kid eight years old, nine years old, ten years old, or if I'm working with a man 75 or 80 years old, there, there's no difference. I'm still teaching the same game. So my enthusiasm, my energy, my direction, my input is still trying to better what the better, the better uh, skills that this person has to enjoy this game. If you don't do well, you don't, ex- and you don't enjoy this game. You don't want to play it. So it's imperative to learn how to do well to want to play this game, you know? And so that, I think that's kind of uh, what fantasy campers really enjoy is our intensity, uh, our honesty, and, and, and uh, uh, just who we are, learning who we are. But it is a great yeah. experience. You know, I mean, you know, there's there's uh, uh, MVPs, there's uh, Cy Young winners. You know, we, I mean, we have a variety of people like, you know, Vita Blue and Mike McCormick and Scotty Gorels and, you know, just Mark Davis right. and, you know, Jim God. I mean, the, Jeff Leonard. Uh, we have, you know, Bill Lasky does a great job with the Arizona Diamond uh, Fantasy Camp. I've been going there probably about 20, 21 years, and uh, oh, it's just an enjoyable I'm time. We'll let, we'll, let, we'll let Tim talk about what his perception is. Yeah, it, well, you know, for myself, I was lucky enough to go down and just spend a couple of days. Like, uh, one morning I went out, and the guys were down, and Joel was down there with some of his guys, some of his uh, teammates or some of his players uh, in the cage. Uh, and he's just working with these guys fundamentally and trying to get them to, you know, see, you got to see it to hit it. Um, and having the, uh, the opportunity to stand there for 10 minutes and watch Joel work with the kid, a guy who is, uh, you know, having a little bit of trouble making contact with the ball or the kind of con- squaring it up the way he'd like to. And uh, watching Joel transform in front of various, you know, right in front of my eyes, watching this guy go from a swing and miss situation where he's really starting to make some solid, good, good solid contact. And what you see from from my vantage point is a guy, it's just like Joel said, and beginning to enjoy it. He's relaxing. He's having fun. He's smiling now. He's he's really getting excited about the opportunity to get into the game and 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 get a base hit. Um, so that was part of my experience there. I I really just went down and you know Bill Lasky asked if I'd come down and, and attend a couple dinners and say hi to everybody. And, um, I I was there for a kangaroo court um, and Bill introduced me. You know, his dad's Tom Haller's son, that kind of thing. For me, really, it, it's it, it was kind of like old home week, getting to see some of these guys that I haven't seen in years, like Joel, um, who are a big part of my life. You know, growing up and 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 you know, young adulthood, 
and the impressions these guys made on me as a player and as a man, as a person. Um, the, my memories are are just awesome. I mean, just having an opportunity to run around and play and work out with these guys when I was younger and uh, and then get to see them now that we're um, on the other side of the hill, uh, it's it's a treat, you know. Um, and that's well, my experience. For me, it's, it's the hill to be over. I never had a hill to be over, which um, – <laughs> so – Go ahead, Timmy. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you know, I I just think for me it's you know it's just it, it, it you know I look at these guys as family really I mean and and you know dad laid the dad laid the groundwork for that the opportunity for myself and and it and just kind of it's really exciting to see a guy like Gary Davenport you know who's been now with the Giants organization for what, 13 years, he and I growing up together and playing against each other and playing with each other. And that whole, um, you know, that that just that whole thing, um, you know, Joel and, and Scotty Durant and Vida Blue and Rich Murray, all these guys, these guys are friends of mine. They're like, and they're like long lost brothers to a, to a certain degree. And so that's, that's the thing, you know, that I, um, embrace so much and and you know having lost my dad at an early age and and what he really you know what what baseball meant to him and these guys you know guys like Joel and all these other fellows that played with him and for him um that that brotherhood that friendship is you know it's impenetrable it's 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 something it's really special and uh, I'm just grateful to be a part of that you know yeah well, special kudos for uh, Mr. Las- Lasky for um, doing it. He's been doing it at least 20 years um, as well. And um, Bill Lasky. Um, yeah, the great tree. He's a knucklehead, though, because he was a pitcher. And, and Joel and I just, we know about pitchers, you know. Yeah, well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's been a guest, and we hope to have him back uh, soon. And um, anything you want to – any memories of being a giant uh, that you want to share that uh, stand out in your head, Joel? Well, number one is, is I'd have to say that I'll always remember my time with San Francisco Giants, you know, living in San Francisco – uh, the areas I lived in, you know, around the ballpark and, uh, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge, the skyline, what a tremendous opportunity to, to have that culture in my life. You know, Candlestick wasn't the best place to, to remember, but, you know, it, it, there, it has a place in my heart because it was the one place that I didn't want to go as a free agent, and it was where I ended up going. But I, I learned to – realize the value of what it offered because when you went to the East Coast, it was 100 degrees, and you come back to San Francisco and it was 60, it really felt good. Uh, But I I just think that number one is I know San Francisco is a top-notch organization. I've been with five. I played with five organizations, and I've coached with two others. This is my third, so that's eight. And uh, San Francisco is a top, top-notch top organization. I'll always respect them and hold them very high as, as a high-quality organization. But, uh, you know, I, had, I, I think it comes down to the players more so, Ralph and Tim. I think, you know, when I look back and, you know, Daryl Evans, Jack Clark, and all those guys that, you know, I lockered close to. And after games, we'd go into the rooms and talk about hitting uh, you know, those those are some great times playing cards with Donnie Robinson, you know, on the plane and, and yeah. you know, all the little arguments we would have, you know, with all the other every guy you know, it was it was a blast. You know, and, and Jeff Leonard. You happen to have been history. with a an historic giant year. Eighty seven was terrific. Um Yeah. Any memories of that? The Saint Louis, the the fight, um Anything yep. you can think 
Oh, yeah. I, I remember the fight. I remember that whole incident. Uh, you know, it it wasn't, you know, I mean, it, it is what it is. It happened, and that's that's what happened. Uh, All right. But, but in, in 87, I, I, there's a strong memory because I broke my wrist right before the playoffs. Uh, Roger Craig put me in the game to play uh, left field to get some at bats before the playoffs started. And Tom Brownie was fouling balls off, and I kind of came in real shallow, and he hit a ball in the foul territory. When I dove for it, I didn't realize how close that brick fence was to me. And I had to protect my head with my uh, hands, and I broke one of my wrists. Uh, oh. and so I, I missed the playoffs. So I was there at the cast, but I missed playing. But it was a tremendous year from, from a, a player's team, you know, our team. Our players did a great job. Uh, you know, I, I think we should have won those games, but we didn't. Uh, it was it was just a great time uh, to share, yeah. you know, with, you know, the success of the Will Clarks. And, you know, I remember Al oh, Dredd. Jeffrey Leonard. And, uh, yeah. Had to, had to be. Silly the, the Jeffrey Leonard story, he gets a bad rap because of his expression. They called him Penitentiary Face. And <laughs> I got the opportunity to meet him several times. He is far from anything like that. And do uh, you have any memories of, of him? Absolutely. I remember when I was with the Mets and he was with uh, the Houston Astros, we'd be running in the outfield. He wouldn't look at me. He had that, that like, hard face on all the time. And right. so then when we got then when I got traded to the Giants and he came over, we really became really good friends. Uh, but if you don't know him, he can be intimidating. Uh, right. He's, <laughs> Absolutely. He, he, he's, and I think that's what that penitentiary phase comes from. But uh, he, he's he's a, he's a good man. I enjoy being with him. I always have a lot of fun with him. And. Uh, and actually, we used to lock her real close to each other. We used to go at it every day verbally. We get the whole clubhouse going. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. That. Um, <laughs> um, I want to just ask you one more thing, and uh, and then I'll shut up and leave leave it to Tim. You came up with Cincinnati, and you yes. closed your career with Cincinnati. Wow. Yes. You want to yep. talk about that a little bit? The, well, well, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know. You know, I got I was I was signed in 1970 with the Cincinnati Reds, and uh, you know when you get to the big leagues as a young player, you know you think that's the only organization in your life, and the first time you get traded, it's kind of like a real setback. You know, it's kind of hard to understand what's really going on now. You know, because there wasn't a lot of talk back in those days. So then. So I got my first hit with the Reds, and I had, I had my last hit with the Reds. So I played with Pete, Pete Rose. I played for, uh, against him, and I played for him. And he was kind of my idol when I was coming up. I kind of used to read all of his magazines, his stories, his articles. and and uh, so well, I, I, He I, had an article in sport when he was young and coming up, and the picture of him diving into the base, and you couldn't help but root for a guy with that kind of intensity. He was just oh, n- no, no way. question. Um, no question. He I was can... the most he was the most impressive player day in and day out that I've ever played with or against. Um can, can I just say something he didn't hit a lot of home runs, but he had many, many, many more doubles than George Brett, who didn't hit a lot of home runs. And there was somebody else. I was just reading the stat about Pete Rose. He, um, his batting credentials were incredible. Um, they didn't. I'd like to see OPS. Um, they didn't have that. That wasn't prevalent in those days. But I'll bet it wasn't. Everybody's thinking Mantle had an expression. Well, if I only hit X number of home runs, I'd wear a dress or something like that to him, kidding him. But no, he had gap to gap power. Pete Rose did, and uh, what? you you can't teach that kind of intensity. Well, 
the one thing that Pete did that nobody realizes is Pete was trying to win the batting title every year. So Pete wasn't really interested in trying to show everybody how much power he had. He was in it to get over 200 hits and lead the league in hitting. That was his goal. Uh, and in order to be that successful, you have to hit line drives. And, and this is the reason why. If you if you hit, right. if you hit the ball horizontal to the ground, you eliminate the amount of time the defense gets to the ball. If you take away the defense, you're always successful. If you're always successful, you always play. If you always play, you're going to make a lot of money. It's real simple, simple logic. Right. Once you think and about it. When you think but about I, it, too, on the other hand, I guess, I guess that, he had the versatility that you got that you had. Um, right. Oh, but Ralph, I got to tell you this. On the other hand, if I would have had that same focus or knowledge that Pete did. I really believe I could have had a much better career. I've always, I always thought I was a 300 hitter, but consequently I never hit 300. I mean, I hit for, I don't know how many bats, 350 one year. I led the Giants in hitting one year. But the bottom line is I was a little guy that wanted to hit a lot of home runs, and that was a mistake. I should have been a, a small guy that wanted to lead the league in hitting and had a more disciplined approach, and I would have been more su- successful, and I would have played a lot more. That's my opinion of myself. Okay. Well, um, as it was, you played, what, 14 years in the big leagues? Yes, sir. Uh, not too bad, my friend. Not too bad. Timmy, you want to uh, – anything to add? And um – you know, I, I just, I, I again, I just want to reach out and just say thanks to Joel uh, for being here tonight. But also, you know, I've never really expressed to him, um, you know, the influence that he had on me as a player. Uh, you know, I, I was a utility guy later on as I, I kind of trudged through, you know, my minor league career. And um, in 1983, uh Joel hit 289, 17 home runs. I can't remember how many runs you drove in. But having that kind of an influence just on me personally was huge. Um, And, you know, watching and, and, uh, you know, just being able to sort of uh, live vicariously through a lot of these guys that I got to, you know, work out with and and that kind of thing, it was just a huge influence and it was a – you know, uh, a treat really to be able to, to be around Joel as a young, as a young guy like that. Um, you know, um, the one thing that I think impressed me most about Joel was, um, he, he was a quiet leader. Um, he always had a smile on his face, but he let his, t- he did his talking between the white lines, you know, and, uh, and that's something that, um, was always really taught to me by my father. You know, Joe Youngblood was a Tom Haller player. You know, he's the kind of guy that my dad wanted, and uh, it's fortunate that that, that things kind of ended up the way that they did, and, and Joel ended up in San Francisco for six years, and, and uh, you know, and, and he's remembered as, as a giant, really. Uh, so those are the so things. Well, you remember the Bay Area so, so fondly. Where did you live... Uh in the Bay Area? I, I lived in Burlingame my first year, and then I lived in Foster City after that. Okay. Uh, so those are the areas windy. I lived in. A yep. little windy sometimes. Just like just like the stick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so you knew what it was going to be like every day when you went to work. And yep. uh, a quick Roger Craig story, maybe? Uh, oh boy, there's, you may, hum baby, I, you know, I, here's a story. We're playing okay. the New York Mets, okay, and we're getting beat pretty bad, and, and Lefferts is pitching, and so Roger calls me in, because I always wanted to throw one game in, in the major leagues. I threw exhibition games in big leagues against AAA, but I never threw in a major league, major league game, so... We were losing about about seven runs or something. Roger told me to go in the bullpen and get loose. 
because we needed some pitching or something. So I ran down there to get loose, and, and our team scored like four runs that inning. When I came in, he said, Joel, I can't let you go back in the game. I said, why? He said, no, no, I can't do it. Go get Leopards out of the clubhouse and tell him he's still in the game. <laughs> so I never got the game. I warmed up. <laughs> I warmed up in Candlestick. And I thought I was going to get my debut against the Mets, and uh, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. Uh, and had you done that, you would have been one of the very few that had played all nine positions at the major league level, huh? That's correct. Yeah. Well, well oh, darn it. Well, God darn it, Raj. Why would you do that? We're crying out loud. And here's one thing that you did do, and I don't think any other major leaguer has ever done this, Joel, and that is get a base hit for two different clubs on the same day. And uh, if my memory serves me, and I asked you about this last week, you guys were in Chicago, you were playing with the Mets, and you got traded, they pulled you from the game, you had to go back to your hotel, you forgot something, you had to go back to the ballpark, you got to the airport, you flew into Philadelphia where the Expos, who you'd been traded to, you got suited up, the game was in the mid-game, you got called on to pinch hit, and you got another base hit with them. Now, how in God's name does somebody do that? Other than, I get it, years ago they didn't have air travel, they were going everywhere on trains, but you got a base hit. No, and, he was and going, he had air travel. It was, we're not that old, Timmy boy. You're young. No, I'm just saying they couldn't have done it back then because there was air travel. He was able to get to both cities and get a base hit in both games. Right. Well, I just learned it wasn't in Mont. I thought you had made the second hit in Montreal, and it was on the road in Philadelphia, which makes it um, much more feasible um, to have done that. Have you been asked about that once or twice, Joel? Uh, I've been asked about that a few times. And <laughs> the, 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 I, I, I took a 605 flight out of Chicago, which is 705 Philly time. I didn't land in Philly until 905. It's a two-hour flight. I had to wait for my luggage, get in the cab, go to Veterans Stadium. So I got to Veterans Stadium about 945. The game was still going on. Five minutes after I got there, I, I was – pitch hitting and uh, off of Steve Carlton and it got a base hit. Well, very cool. Very cool. That was very that, that is beyond awesome. That's beyond awesome. No, beyond awesome is that we got to know you so you're not going to be remembered as just that guy that did that. It is beyond awesome. But what you did in a career, what you're doing as a coach, that's awesome. That's beyond beyond. So uh, what a privilege for me to have you on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And the show is Giants Past, Present, Future. Uh, Timmy, you were the host, as usual, terrific. And uh, Joel, thank you for your time and, um, and your passion. Thank you very much. And to all the Giants fans, uh, we highly uh, appreciate and love you. That's all I can say is that's what drives us to come to the ballpark is to play play well enough for the fans. And San Francisco nice. fans are great fans. So I thank both of you for having me. Thank you, Timmy. Thank you, Ralph. Hey, I love you, Joel. Be good, and, and good luck this coming season, all right, and be safe. Okay. T- you take care. Beautiful. Bye-bye, everybody. Uh, for the fans out there, uh, keep on keeping on, everybody. And Timmy and I – We'll be back same time, same bat station. Uh, Thank you, Timmy boy. You got it. Thank you, guys. Take care. All right. Thanks, everybody. See ya.